This is our last lecture video of this unit, and unfortunately we're going to wrap things up by looking at some technical details. Now again, just like I said in my syntax video, uh, it doesn't really matter too much here about memorizing any of the technical details. A lot of this is just learning by doing ultimately in the end, but I just want to wrap things up and pose some problems for us to think about that will sort of lead us into the future sections, and uh, that's what we're going to do here. So what we're going to look at are logical equivalencies, and we've seen logical equivalencies and we've been using them for quite a while. So all of our sentential logic, logical equivalencies, hold in predicate logic. As long as you're doing them over the same sort of logical connectives, we're not going to have any problems. So these all hold. Uh, same with these ones, the double negation, contrapositive, exportation. Uh, exportation, of course, is an important one. We use that a bunch. And uh, yeah, I just want to sort of make it clear that these are all good. I'm just going to highlight a couple extra ones that we've been using and highlight some problems that are, we're going to think about and what comes next. Here's a logical equivalence that we've been making use of already in this unit. This one says if phi or psi is in the antecedent, and then that implies some theta, then we can split it up as a conjunction, so phi implies theta and psi implies theta. This is sort of just a fancy way of highlighting the cat-dog example, and I'm just pointing this out that this is a perfectly usable logical equivalence that comes up quite a bit in predicate logic. So if I want to say cats and dogs are cute, I can say it as a conjunction statement, which is on the right side of the biconditional, or I can say it as a disjunctive statement in the antecedent, which is the left side of the biconditional. So here's one that we've been using a lot. Here's another one that we've been looking at, which is phi arrow psi and phi arrow theta, if and only if, or logical equivalent to phi arrow psi and theta. Again, this is just a formal way of saying something like this. Yang, who is funny, drinks cortados. I can say uh, Yang is funny, then I can say Yang drinks cortados, or then I can say Yang is funny and drinks cortados, or something like that. You know, these don't translate so perfectly because I'm trying to use abstract language and so on, but this is the general idea. Now, I'm just pointing out that these are logically equivalent, but I haven't proven that these are logically equivalent yet. Remember, that's something that we're missing right now in predicate logic. We also know that I have all my negation of rules, our logical equivalents. We did this in sentential logic when we did derivations. But of course, I've introduced to you a new negation rule, which is quantifier negation. Now, strictly speaking, this here is the form of quantifier negation that uh, we will sort of eventually prove and use in our derivation system. But that's not really that important to us in symbolization. So I'm going to put here the quantifier negation in symbolization, and this is the sort of logically equivalent forms that we've used. And in this case, the negation goes from the front to the property, and we search the quantifier. So we've gone over this, we've been using this a lot as well, but it's another one of our very important logical equivalencies. So what we looked at were things all that sort of make sense or fit with what we've been doing, fit nicely with sentential logic. What I'm going to actually finish with are just a warning of some things that don't actually work out, and this is important for you to know so you don't accidentally make this mistake. So here's an example of something that's not a problem, a biconditional. Phi biconditional psi, we know that that is one direction and the other direction. That's what the biconditional means, those are logically equivalent. Now what happens is if I have a universal quantifier in front? For all alpha or for all x, it doesn't really matter. Phi biconditional psi. Can I just split it up into two universal statements with a conjunction? Uh, yes, you can. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly logically equivalent. The problem happens is when we try and do this with an existential. If I have there exists alpha phi biconditional psi, can I split that up into the two sentences like this? And it turns out the answer is no. And if you look closely, you can sort of see why. The one in the green, that's saying something has this property that if it's a phi, then it's a psi. Okay. And the one with the purple is saying that something has a property if it's a psi, then it's a phi. Okay. But those two things could be different. You know, one could be a rock and one could be a paper airplane or something like that. We have no idea if they're the same thing. And if you look on the left side of the biconditional, it is asserting that it is the same thing. So these are actually not logically equivalent, even though you might think you can do it because of the sort of previous forms of the biconditional. So you've got to be careful in this particular case. Another thing that comes up uh, which you need to be careful about is quantifier order. 
So in this example, if I have two universal quantifiers, can I switch the order of them? You know, if it's if I started with for all x, for all y, is that the same as saying for all y, for all x, and then the same sentence? It turns out the answer is yes, you can do that. Uh, you might ask, why would you do that? Well, it doesn't come up too much yet, but it comes up more in multi-place predicate logic. But another uh, thing is, if you're sort of a math or computer science student, you might actually think in these terms quite naturally. So this is sort of addressing that. Uh, can you do this with the existential? If you have there exists an x, there exists a y, can you swap the order to be there exists a y, there exists an x, and have it have the same meaning? Turns out the answer is yes, no problem. Now, what if you have a mix of quantifiers? If you have a universal followed by an existential, can you switch the order so you have an existential and then a universal? Are these always going to be logically equivalent? And here, it turns out the answer is no. So this is important to know. You don't want to just be messing around with quantifier order when you have different quantifiers. Uh, you can mess around with the order if they're the same quantifiers. I'm not sure why you would want to, but you can. It's when they're different that we come up with problems. We're going to finish off by just looking at one other sort of odd puzzle. So let's look at these two sentences. Are they equivalent? When, when you look at the two, you should see that the only difference between them is I didn't actually change the order of the quantifiers like I was talking about just a moment ago. What I did was I increased the scope of the quantifier. So on the right side, the existential scope, the there exists a y, runs over the entire sentence. And on the left side, the first one, the existential only modifies the g. Now, you might think this is not a problem because the y only appears in the g, and I'm extending the scope of the existential over something that isn't really relative to or related to it, which doesn't really matter. Uh, and you'd be right. It turns out that these are perfectly equivalent. There's no problem with it. And here's another example. So here the example is the same. I start off with a small scope on the existential. It's just the cons it's, it's the g and the consequent. And then I change that. I pull the existential out to the front, and I make the scope of the existential the entire conditional statement. Uh, I haven't switched the order of the quantifiers. Are these equivalent? The answer is yes. So you might wonder why this matters. Uh, some people really like putting all the quantifiers in the front and then symbolizing a sentence. And what I'm showing you is in these contexts, you can do that if you want to. It doesn't really matter that you extended the scope and put the quantifiers all at the front. What about this example, though? So in this example, it's a little different, I guess, but it's basically the same idea. Here I have the universal for all x, fx, and notice that the universal scope is just the fx, which is in the antecedent. And then I pull the universal to the front, and I get the uh, sentence as follows, where the scope of the universal is the entire conditional sentence. Of course, I could then pull the existential out as well, preserve quantifier order, and I could ask the same question. But for now, let's just focus on this. Are these equivalent? Well, you might just assume that the answer is yes. I told you the first two are equivalent. But it turns out here the answer is no. Uh, you cannot rip the quantifier in this last case to the front and increase the scope over the entire conditional. It, it will not create a logically equivalent sentence. So in general, if you really care about this sort of thing, you can remember that pulling quantifiers out to increase the scope range works for and and or, but you're going to have problems for the conditionals and the biconditionals, biconditionals for sure. And in general, you just can't really increase the scope of a quantifier. Uh, so this sort of matters because some people will want to put the quantifiers all at the front, thinking it won't impact their sentence, but it turns out that it does in conditional cases. So you don't really want to have to worry about this, and the best thing is to just not worry about this by not doing it. Fortunately, the scope symbolization tips that I taught you, where you open a scope wherever you use a new group and you close the scope whenever you are done with that group, make it so that you don't actually fall into this trap. How we've been symbolizing all along avoids the problems that I just talked about. And also, that previous slide explains why it is that these two are not uh, equivalent. Well, that's not actually true. I didn't explain it. I told you that they're not equivalent. What I'm missing is actually the ability to prove to you that they're not equivalent. Because you, as you should sort of already notice, we don't have a proof system yet for predicate logic.
All right, that's it for this short video. We're just wrapping up and tying up some loose ends, so just careful with your scope, careful with moving around the quantifiers. But like I said, you don't have to worry about any of this if you've been symbolizing using the canonical form and following the tips that I've outlined with respect to scope and so on. Uh, what's next? Well, that's the end of this unit. We have a little wrap-up video, but our next tool that we need is that proof system, it's derivations.